Canada, a people's history. Proudly presented with the corporate partnership support of Sun Life Financial and by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Late at night, somewhere near the Richelieu River in Lower Canada, a secret ceremony is unfolding. These men are plotting an armed rebellion. They call themselves hunters, frères chasseurs. They want to make Canada a North American republic independent of Britain. Of my own free will and in the presence of God Almighty, I do solemnly swear to observe the secret signs and mysteries of the Hunter's Lodge. To help any brother. Joseph Senet is one of the recruits. I was told that the Americans will come with weapons and that they will be assisted by our countrymen that will rise in great numbers and that with this army, we will attack simultaneously in different locations and that the present government will be overthrown and another, formed on the American model, will be established. The hunters swear they will give their lives for the cause of freedom. It is a price many will be called to pay. All this I promise without reservation. If I'm unfaithful to this oath? If I am unfaithful to this oath, I consent to see my property destroyed and to have my own throat cut to the bone. In the 1830s, Canada lives through some of its darkest and most desperate hours. Demands for political freedom lead to armed rebellion. Violent confrontation with one of the world's most powerful armies. Shouts of victory from the great revolutions in France and America still echo around the world. The mightiest empires of Europe and Latin America are shaken to their foundations. In Canada, the currents of revolution exact a terrible cost. Hundreds die on the battlefields, and dozens more are hanged as traitors. But from the ashes of this failed revolution, something new is born. An alliance of Democrats that brings Canada a new political future. In the years after 1820, British North America seems a tranquil, even an idyllic place. It is a land of seemingly inexhaustible natural resources, where men and women make their living in the forests and the fields. Every autumn, armies of lumberjacks invade the brooding timber stands of Canada and New Brunswick. 
And every spring, the raftsmen float tens of thousands of logs out to market. From the Ottawa River to the Miramichi, from the St. Lawrence to the St. John, wood has replaced fur as the economic engine of British North America. Many of these logs are used to build ships, here in Quebec City or in other colonial ports. The Royal William, the first Canadian steamship to cross the Atlantic, was launched here in 1831. But most colonial lumber goes to the building sites of Great Britain. Every year, hundreds of ships bearing cargoes of elm, oak, and pine set sail from Quebec and St. John, New Brunswick. And every year, they return with a very different cargo. Thousands of men, women, and children. The beginning of an unprecedented wave of immigration. One of these immigrants, Catherine Parr Trail, is enchanted by her new home as she sails up the St. Lawrence in 1832. The misty curtain is slowly drawn up as if by invisible hand, and the wild wooden mountains partially revealed with their bold, rocky and sweeping bays. At other times, the vapory volume dividing moves along the valleys in deep ravines like lofty pillars of smoke, or hangs in snowy draperies among the dark forest pines. By the 1830s, 30,000 newcomers a year land at Quebec. The gateway to the Canadas. Some are relatively prosperous, middle-class families fleeing a climate of economic stagnation that has gripped England, Scotland, and Ireland since the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Others are less fortunate, but all seek a better life in the new world. Canada is the land of hope. Here, everything is new, everything going forward, it is scarcely possible for art, sciences, agriculture, manufacturers to retrograde. They must keep advancing. Some immigrants settle in Lower Canada. But most continue on to the Western frontier. Upper Canada is the fastest growing colony in the British Empire. By 1831, there are already 260,000 people here. The new immigrants from the British Isles mix with the descendants of loyalists and American settlers who came in the wake of the American Revolution. Through land purchases and the sheer weight of numbers, the Aboriginal peoples who once had this land to themselves are slowly but surely being pushed aside. Settlers like Catherine Parr Trail soon realize that beyond the cities, much of Upper Canada is still just a step removed from the wilderness. Much as I had seen and heard of the badness of the roads in Canada, I was not prepared for such a one as we travelled along this day. Indeed, it hardly deserved the name of a road. 
Sometimes I laughed because I would not cry. The difficulty of building roads has so far kept most settlements stretched out along the shores of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. But some are now moving north into the backcountry. Pioneer life is hard and men like Robert Davis are becoming angry. I've had in most instances made my own roads and bridges, cleared my own farm, educated myself and my children. I've had my bones broken by the fall of trees, my feet lacerated by the axe, and suffered almost everything except death. I waited year after year in hope of better days, expecting that the government would care less for themselves and more for the people. But every year, I have been disappointed. The neighboring colony of Lower Canada has been settled much longer, for 200 years. Half a million people live here, in well-established towns and farm communities spreading out from the St. Lawrence. The flourishing state of the countryside along the Richelieu River impresses the colony's surveyor general, Joseph Bouchette. Its banks are diversified on each side by many farms and extensive settlements in a very high state of improvement. Some neat, populous and flourishing villages, handsome churches, numerous mills of various kinds, good roads in all directions, with every other characteristic of a country inhabited by an industrious population. The parish of Saint-Denis on the Richelieu now has 3,000 inhabitants. Charles Saint-Germain owns the biggest hat-making business in the colony. Francois Gadbois sells his horse-drawn carriages in Quebec City, Montreal and even in Upper Canada. But not everyone is so prosperous. In the countryside around Saint-Denis, peasants cultivate land that is not their own, a legacy of New France's feudal origins. Year after year, they must turn over a substantial portion of their harvest to the landlord, called the Seigneur. For many hard-pressed families, the burden is too heavy to bear. Louis Duquet has been evicted from his farm on the Seigneury of Beauharnois. He and his young family must seek out a new plot of land and rebuild their lives. Most of the good seigneurial land is now occupied, and the seigneurs are demanding higher rents every year. In desperation, the tenant farmers turn to their representatives in the Legislative Assembly, demanding protection and redress. A great many seigneurs treated these lands as if they had absolute authority over them, selling and transferring them at exorbitant prices by means of illegal contracts, while His Majesty's Canadian subjects have not, until now, been protected against these abuses. On the quiet farms of Lower Canada, the rumblings of discontent are growing louder. Soon, the anger will explode. The 
newspapers of British North America are small-scale operations with a great capacity to provoke and irritate the powerful. This is the age of the partisan press. All through the colonies in Halifax, Quebec, Montreal and York, opposition journalists attack what they consider an arbitrary, self-appointed colonial regime. Whatever goes to extend or to secure the advantages which of right ought to flow to the people, we shall steadily and fearlessly uphold. But these early muckrakers will pay a high price. In York, the capital of Upper Canada, a gang of thugs destroys the presses of the colonial advocate. Its editor, William Lyon Mackenzie, has been heaping scorn on the colony's leaders. The family connection rules Upper Canada. A dozen nobodies and a few placemen, pensioners, and individuals of well-known, narrow, and bigoted principles. The whole of the revenue of Upper Canada are, in reality, at their mercy. They are paymasters, receivers, auditors, king, lords, and commons. Mackenzie denounces this circle of appointees that surrounds the governor as the family compact. He identifies them by name, exposes their family connections, publishes their income. One of his chief targets is the Attorney General, John Beverly Robinson. Another reptile has sprung up in a Mr. William McKenzie, a conceited red-headed fellow with an apron. He said that I am the most subtle advocate of arbitrary power. What vermin. Mackenzie installs new presses and continues his crusade. The step to direct involvement in politics, election to the Legislative Assembly, is a small one. I'd long seen the country in the hands of a few shrewd, crafty, covetous men, under whose management one of the most lovely and desirable sections of America remained a comparative desert. The most obvious improvements were stayed. Dissension was created among classes, and large estates were wrested from their owners in utter contempt of even the forms of the courts. Hey! In Nova Scotia, another rabble-rousing journalist takes aim at his colony's unelected rulers. Oh! Halifax is the gateway to the Atlantic colonies and a military stronghold. Joseph Howe, editor of the Nova Scotian, is the son of a loyalist, but no friend of the local elite. His newspaper accuses them of stealing public money. In a young and poor country, where the sons of rich and favored families alone receive education at the public expense, where the many must toil to support the extortions and exactions of a few, where the hard earnings of the people are lavished on an aristocracy who repay their ill-timed generosity with contempt and insult. It requires no ordinary nerve in men of moderate circumstances and humble pretensions to stand forward and boldly protest against measures which are fast working the ruin of the province. All rise. His Lordship, the Chief Justice, Brenton Halliburton, presiding. The leaders of the colony drag Howe into court on the criminal charge of defamatory libel. I know them as you know them, as the most negligent and imbecile, if not the most reprehensible body that ever mismanaged a people's affairs. They may expect much from the result of this trial, but before I have done with them, I hope to convince them that it is they, and not I, that are the real criminals here. 
When Howe is acquitted by a jury, his popularity is greater than ever, and like Mackenzie, he goes into politics. We are desirous of a change, not such as shall divide us from our brethren across the water, but which will ensure to us what they enjoy. Gentlemen, all we ask is what exists at home in England, a system of responsibility to the people. The governor's men in Quebec City, the power center of Lower Canada, are also coming under attack. Two journalists have dared to criticize the Legislative Council. It is appointed by the governor and blocks almost every law the elected assembly passes. They are sentenced to 40 days in jail for defamatory libel. Daniel Tracy, an Irishman, is editor of The Vindicator. Ludger Duvernay, a French-Canadian, publishes the newspaper La Minerve. As the present Legislative Council is perhaps our greatest nuisance, we ought to seize the means to rid ourselves of it and demand its abolition. Both newspapers speak for the Parti Patriote, a group of Canadian legislators and their supporters. They control the elected, but largely powerless, Legislative Assembly. Their leader's name is Louis-Joseph Papineau. The votes and measures adopted every day by the councillors may only be explained by their impassioned hatred of the Canadian, their insatiable lust for money, and their odious selfishness. Papineau is a lawyer and a seigneur. Early in his career, he was an admirer of the British Constitution. But years of struggle with an appointed governor have made him an advocate of American-style democracy. I do not believe it possible to be happy and fairly treated under the colonial system. How can a governor act justly? Even one who sincerely desires to do so when he is surrounded by such a pack of scoundrels. It is certain that in a time not long from now, all of America must become Republican. We need only to know that we live in America and to know in what condition we have lived there. Louis-Joseph Papineau, William Lyon Mackenzie, Joseph Howe, three men inspired by the democratic ferment sweeping Europe and the Americas, determined to change a hidebound political system, one way or another. Montreal in 1832 is the economic heart of the two Canadas. 27,000 people live here, half French-speaking and half English. Commerce is controlled by a handful of English-speaking merchants and industrialists, men like John Molson and Peter McGill. That spring, political rivals gather on the Place d'Armes in a bitterly contested by-election. On one side, the English party. It backs the governor and his appointed advisors. On the other, the Patriot, mostly French Canadians and Irish immigrants who share their distrust of British authority. There is no secret ballot. Every voter must declare his or her allegiance publicly. My name is Marie Roy. I am a widow and I'm going to vote for the Patriot candidate. 
Daniel Tracy. My name is Pierre Picard. The poll remains open as long as voters continue to come forward. Leon Charlebois, innkeeper. I vote for the Patriot Party. Leon Fournier, Mason. An election can go on for weeks. This one will last 22 days. Thomas Nolan, I'm a grocer. April 26. It being 10 o'clock in the morning, the poll has not yet been able to open due to the tumult going on outside. May 21st. The Patriot candidate has taken a narrow lead. Emotions are running high. The polls go! Tracy ahead by three votes! Three French Canadians are mortally wounded. Casimir Chauvin, Pierre Billet, and Francois Languedoc. The next day, the Patriot candidate is declared victorious. Louis-Joseph Papineau expresses his outrage to the governor, Lord Aylmer. My heart is filled with sadness. And my letter will find you in the same state as you will already have heard about yesterday's disastrous events that caused bloodshed in our streets. The troops sent to protect His Majesty's subjects fired upon them. Canada has never before been afflicted with such miseries. A few weeks later, more misery for the beleaguered colony. The Carrick, arriving from Ireland, docks in Quebec City with several feverish passengers on board. Three days later, cholera claims its first victim. The disease spreads like wildfire, quickly reaching Montreal. June 14, 1832. Since Monday morning, Montreal is in turmoil, and the alarm is growing every minute. There is no longer doubt that cholera is present. We recommend that the public observe strictly the regulations of the Board of Health. The epidemic is out of control. Hundreds of victims die each day, especially in the cities. The poor districts are ideal breeding grounds for the disease. No sewers. No collection of garbage, contaminated water. There is no use in becoming alarmed. When the illness appears, one must see a doctor at once and should follow his instructions. The apothecary is of all the remedies in stock. Their prices are affordable to all pocketbooks. But in fact, the doctors are overwhelmed and powerless. They believe cholera is transmitted by foul vapors that spread through the atmosphere. Hoping to purify the tainted air, soldiers fire off cannon blasts, and the Board of Health sets barrels of tar on fire. Alexander Hart, a Jewish merchant in Montreal, sees death all around him. None of us go into town anymore. Many are moving into the country. Yesterday, 34 corpses passed our house. Today, 23. Not counting those in the old burial ground and in the Catholic ground. 12 carts are employed by the Board of Health to carry away the dead who are interred without prayers. 
cholera claims 9,000 victims, more than half in Lower Canada. Some people believe England is responsible. Jean-Jacques Lartigue, the Bishop of Montreal, tells a cousin of his growing distress. The other subjects that seem to me most worthy of your attention at the present time are the murder of our Canadian on May 21st, which the governor has since officially condoned, and the invasion of our uncultivated land by British immigrants who threatened to drive us out of our country and reduce our population year after year by the spread of disease. An oppressive atmosphere of death, fear, and political mistrust hangs over the colony. All it will take to ignite it is a single spark.